Okay, I think we are just about at, uh, at time to make a start. So uh, welcome along everybody. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever you are uh, in the world. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here uh, this morning, morning in the UK, uh, for this uh, this webinar entitled uh, as part of the ICAMI uh, Evolution um, series. So safer processes for a sustainable world. This is part of the chemical engineering evolution, part of the iChemie's 100th birthday celebration. So uh, take that Queen's Jubilee, right? Uh, thanks very much for, for joining us, everybody. So uh, my name is, uh, is Tom Lakey. I'm a, a research chemical engineer uh, at BP, and uh, I am the chair of the Hull and Humber member group for, for the iChemie. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here to moderate this session today. Uh, where we have a, an absolutely stellar lineup of panelists, all experts in uh, the process and, and safety field. So uh, I hope this is going to be a, a very uh, interesting and stimulating discussion. We've got 360 odd attendees registered, I think Gareth told me, which is uh, uh, incredible. I think that's that's got to be some sort of record. So uh, uh, we know that uh, that our panel here is able to to pull in a crowd, which is fantastic. So we've got a session today. We've got about 90 minutes uh, for this conversation today. Uh, the session is being recorded, I believe. And, and so the recording will be accessible after the event uh, for those who, uh, who, who perhaps missed some of it. So without uh, further ado, I think we'll do a, a few introductions for our panel uh, for this morning. So uh, just briefly on myself, as I mentioned, I'm a chemical engineer at, uh, at BP working in technology development and commercialization. Uh, I've got a master's degree from, um, from the University of Nottingham and a PhD in biomass gasification from the University of Sheffield. But I'm here uh, as the, uh, the chair of the ICME Holland Humber member group to, uh, to moderate this, this discussion today. So uh, thanks very much for inviting me along. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure. So our first panelist this morning is uh, Dame Judith Hackett, DBE, FRN, and Fellow of the ICME. So Judith is a Chair and Non-Executive Director in various engineering-based organizations, and of course, a former president of the ICME. So uh, Dame Judith has 25 years experience in chemicals manufacturing, including running major hazard sites. Uh, she was Chair of the UK Health and Safety Executive for 10 years to 2016 and uh, also authored the independent review into building safety and fire regulations in high-rise buildings in the wake of the Grenfell Tower disaster. So Judith is currently chair of the Royal Academy of Engineering Safer Complex Systems Project. A very warm welcome to you, Judith. Thanks very much for, for joining us this morning. Hi. Next then, uh, Ian Schott, executive chairman of Schott Trinova. So Ian Schott, CBE is the co-founder and former executive chair of Arsinova, a contract research and development company focused on pharmaceuticals and life sciences. He's also the managing partner of Shot Trinova, through which he invests in chairs and leads a portfolio of technology businesses. Ian previously held several global leadership positions with multinational life science companies and was located in the UK, Switzerland, USA and France. As uh, another past president of the ICME, he is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, chairing the Enterprise Committee, having created the Enterprise Hub in 2012. He's created and chaired the UK's Leadership Forum for Industrial Biotechnology in 2009, helped form the Chemistry Growth Partnership with Government on Industrial Strategy, and sat on the governing board of Innovate UK for six years, chairing the Catapult Committee and chaired the Industrial Biotechnology Innovation Centre in Scotland for five years, having started up in 2014. So Ian, a very warm welcome to you as well. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we have uh, Trish Kerrin, who's the director of the iChemi Safety Centre. So after graduating with honours in mechanical engineering, Trish spent several years working in project management, operational and safety roles for the oil, gas and chemical industries. Trish has represented industry on many government committees related to process safety and was board member of the Australian National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority. That's easy to say. She is a member of the Mary Kay O'Connor Process Safety Centre Steering Committee. Trish is a chartered engineer, registered professional process safety engineer, a fellow of the ICME and fellow of Engineers Australia. Trish holds a diploma in OHS, is a graduate of the Australian Institute of company directors 
and holds a Master of Leadership. Uh, Trish, very warm welcome to you. Uh, good evening, we should say to you, and thanks very much for, for joining us this evening. Thank you, great to be here. And finally, but not least, of course, Professor David Edwards, who's a visiting professor of safety and loss prevention at Loughborough University. David is a chartered chemical engineer with more than 40 years of experience in design and safety, health and environmental matters. He is an authority on inherent safer design and was head consultant for working environment before he retired in 2020. David worked with Trevor Kletz and wrote one of the seminal papers on inherent safety. He drove KBR Consulting Hazards Focused Risk Based Approach to Design, which is founded on inherent safety. For the last five years of his working life, he specialized in human factors engineering and working environment in upstream oil and gas production and processing installations. He has published 93 papers and has presented at many international conferences. For 10 years, he was editor in chief for safety for the uh, ICME journal, Process Safety and Environmental Protection, during which time its impact factor rose from one to 4.4, positioning it 21st out of 138 chemical engineering journals. He is also uh, honorary treasurer of the ICME and a member of the board of trustees. So David, uh, thank you for joining us today and a very warm welcome to you as well. Hi. Fantastic. So these uh, are our four panelists for today. A very warm welcome, as I've said to all of you. Thank you for joining us today, giving us a stellar lineup. I think then we can move on to our, our first question, uh, which I've uh, summarized here on, on this slide. And uh, I'll give each of our panelists a few minutes, I think, to, uh, to, to answer this question, which I'll just read out now. So a transition to more sustainable chemical and energy processes seems to be gaining momentum, whilst public perception of risk is burgeoning and tolerance of major accident risks is always decreasing. So how do you see chemical engineering contributing in the next few decades? What are the main challenges we will face? And how do we share our knowledge more broadly with other engineering disciplines? I think perhaps we'll uh, perhaps we can start with David on on this one. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, well, my view is we we as chemical engineers um, can contribute to keeping the whole process transition process that is honest. Uh, you know, when you go through change, it throws up a lot of opportunities, and people take advantage of that. Um, and some of them are most of them are scrupulous and uh, and doing their best and for themselves and for others but some of them are not um and so but chemical engineers have the knowledge to uh do the sums and identify the good and the bad guys and i think that's uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we should be doing um so with the challenges uh i think we'll chat we'll commercial and political pressure. So as the commercial pressure is, you know, people want to make money out of things. And sometimes, as I've said, they're not always scrupulous in how they make money. And also there's political, politicians have, do things for all sorts of reasons and uh, not least of which to further their own careers. And that might might be aligned with the, the general good, for, but might be not. Um, so we need to tell our truth. But we need to um, be able to communicate. So I think we need to rise to the challenge of communicating our knowledge and so mobilizing our knowledge in not just in the profession but in the wider world. Um, knowledge sharing, uh, well, uh, research projects, I guess, in universities um, to do more collaborative research, uh, sponsored meetings. I think the institutions need to get together and. Um, get some joint meetings and try and get the dialogue between the disciplines going. Uh, I think there needs to be a certain rationalisation of the engineering institutions as well. I think there's far too many of them. Um, and uh, look at previous successes to see how knowledge has been shared in the past. I mean, you know, there's, uh, you know we need to um, look at how other industries have taken up um, techniques and knowledge from others. Anyway, that's enough from me. I'll give someone else a chance. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, Judith, do you have any, any thoughts on this one, please? Uh, thanks, Tom. I, I think I agree with many of the points that David's made, but, but I think we need to be far more ambitious. 
first of all, I think we have to start with the scale of the challenge, uh, because the 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 tenet of this question kind of assumes that you know pace is gradually building up. We need to recognise that this is a major crisis. The challenges that we face on our planet today, in terms of addressing sustainability, uh, climate change, and everything, this is an urgent problem, and we are not going to do it by incremental moves and fine-tuning what we've been doing in the past. I don't see this as evolution at all. I think this is about revolution. And I would suggest to this audience that it's time that we, as chemical engineers, rethought many of the processes that we've been running for many, many years now, which are inherently unsustainable. Um, so, so for me, the challenge for us as chemical engineers is about redesigning processes, it's about thinking how we will deliver the same benefits that we have been delivering in the past, but in much more sustainable and safer ways, which has to mean rethinking the chemistry, uh, rethinking how we deliver those effects in a much more sustainable way. And if we, if we grasp the size of the problem, then I think many of the things that David has talked about in terms of collaboration, interdisciplinary working, uh, you know, being professional and ethical, being better communicators, all of those things follow as being absolutely essential. But unless we realise the size of the mountain we have to climb, we are not going to achieve what we have to do simply by moving at the same old pace we've been moving for the last 50 years. Yeah, indeed. And do you think then that uh, the chemical engineers have are are sort of well placed to communicate the scale of that problem more so than than other disciplines? Would you say? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Because I think we we have um, probably the strongest knowledge of of uh, any discipline, or as good as any other, of the whole complexity of systems and how you have to change systems rather than just look at single elements of it. And, and I think that that helps us to think systemically about how to make the biggest and most effective changes. Um, but we, we will not do it on our own. Uh, I think the scale of the challenges we face is such that it's absolutely essential that we work better. Uh, I know we've worked well with other disciplines in the past, but it's got to be even better going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Judith. Um, Trish, perhaps we can we can come to you. Do you have any thoughts on this point? Yes, yeah, so I actually uh, delivered a presentation yesterday where I talked about process safety being a team sport. There is a range of different players and coaches and support staff that are all involved in delivering the outcome. And I think we need to approach sustainability more broadly in that sense as well. We need to have the right players in the right positions to deliver the outcome. And I do agree that chemical engineering is placed very well in terms of system thinking. There are other disciplines that also do it reasonably well as well. And I think when we look in industry, and certainly not, I know my experience in industry, I was often involved in multidisciplinary teams delivering a project. We can't do it by ourselves. We have to work together because we each bring something slightly different to the table so that we can get that overall team objective that we're looking for a more sustainable and safer planet, which I think is, it just has to be a given for what we do. So I think we do need to look at some of the lessons we've learned from safety over the years. You know, when we hit a plateau in safety results, then we have to really change up our thinking, challenge the status quo and do something different. And I think now is, is the time now or never to really get in and do something different in the sustainability space as well. And it is deeply tied to the safety space too. The one other area I think that um, the chemical engineers have a really important role to play though is in risk communication and education because we so often see a lack of understanding of what risk is in general society and a, a fear of anything that might be seen as being risky. But when you distill that down, it comes down to people take a lot of risk in their life where they perceive they have control but they don't like handing over risk when they don't perceive they have control. So, you know, the risk of the chemical plant down the road is an unacceptable risk to you because you don't have any control of that. So how can we shift the conversation with people, that communication with the community to make sure they understand what they need to know and we can work collaboratively with them in the future? Because 
we do produce the products that are needed for civilization as we know it. We need to do that far more sustainably though, because the way we have been doing it is not acceptable going forward. As Judith said, you know, we are at a crisis point now, action must be taken. So I think we have a key role to play in that education and helping people as a team, a multidisciplinary team, work through the better outcomes that we're after collectively. Yeah, thanks, Trish. I, I do. Uh, uh, I like that point that uh, that people don't like to hand over control. I think this is why you see people, uh, you know, get nervous of uh, traveling on on aeroplanes, for example. You know, it's uh, it's that feeling of being out of control. So your yes. point about changing uh, public expectations, though, do you think that uh, expectations from the public of the process industries are uh, are also changing, you know, more or less than sort of the general expectations uh, for for governments, or, uh, for example? I, I think the community is quite rightly holding us to a higher and higher standard every year as as things go on. You know, it is totally unacceptable to have a major incident event that harms the environment and that harms people. It's just it, we we cannot do it. It is unacceptable for a business to do this. We've seen time and again how the community reacts to that, and it can lead to business ending events for an organisation. But you know that does that discounts the impact not only of the, of the humans that were injured or killed and their families, but also the environmental impact that we leave for for a long period of time with some of these incidents that are coming. Fantastic. Thanks, Trish. Uh, and Ian, uh, perhaps, uh, yes, we need to give you a chance to, uh, to to make your comments on this question as well, please. Thank you. Um, so I, I agree with all the speakers, but I'm very much more at the revolution end. Um, I think we have to just recognise the power of media and social media and figures such as David Attenborough, Greta Thunberg, etc and events to the political agenda of COP26. So there's absolutely no doubt the, the, the world and, and society are totally focused on this issue and, and we will be held to account. <clears throat> if I go back in history to the Industrial Revolution, um, the world was uh, coming to grips with steam power and uh, chemicals initially for dyestuffs. And, and they were sourced from using the power of coal and, and the resources of coal tar and, uh, and, and, and then latterly oil. And, uh, and engineering and chemical engineering was born to deal with the risks and the complexities of the processes and how they could um, impinge on society. Today, I think we've got a whole new game where we need to move to renewable resources, we need to move from hydrocarbon fuel to carbohydrate fuel, uh, which is uh, a massive change and not only requires uh, good chemical engineering, but chemists and, and biologists and bioscientists uh, in that journey. If we think about new power sources of wind, solar, wave, bio, hydrogen, etc., we're moving to a much more complex system on how to harvest energy, how to harvest uh, feedstocks, and then how to process those feedstocks and, uh, and do that in an innovative and safe way. And, and I think that chemical engineering is ideally placed to be taking a pivotal and lead role here. Not only do chemical engineers have probably the most advanced process systems engineering understanding knowledge and background but it's the only engineering discipline that is plugged into the life sciences most people know that uh, the language of physics is mathematics not so many people know that the language of process biology is chemistry so chemists and chemical engineers and biochemists um, are, are in a key position to think about how to have integrated systems generating maybe hydrogen, biocatalysts, uh, engineered catalysts, etc., and, and, and processes to short circuit the chemical routes to the necessary products and also change the performance of those necessary products, both in terms of the, the positive attributes required by society. Um, in an application, 
but also recyclability and, and circular economy needs. So, uh, so I, I think uh, we, we should be seeing this as the next industrial revolution. People talk about multidisciplinary, and I've been on many panels um, where the academics are quick to demonstrate that various people talk to each other, but they don't necessarily engage in the project uh, management leadership way that Trish Karen mentioned. And at a recent uh, event with um, um, BDSRC and industrialists, uh, the head of, um, uh, of development and research in Unilever said, it's not good enough to have all these disciplines talking to each other. We need people to understand biology, chemistry, engineering, mathematics, modeling. Those people are chemical engineers. Yeah. Thanks very much, Ian. Yeah, that's a, a fantastic point there. Um, well made. I think um, in the interest of time, we'll move on to our, our next question now. Uh, but I will say first to the audience, uh, you will see in the panel where you joined, there is a box for questions. If you have any questions you would like to ask the panel, please volunteer those into the, uh, into the questions box, which is distinct from the chat box, I will just uh, uh, point out as well. And uh, we will have a little bit of time to come to a couple of those questions uh, at the end of the, of the presentation. Thank you for that. Okay, thanks uh, to our panelists. Let's uh, move on to our next question, which is confusingly uh, named question one, but uh, nevertheless. So we are used to uh, most of the processes uh, which chemical engineers work on occurring in a centralized way and at uh, bulk scale, often using temperature, pressure, and artificial catalysts to make reactions happen. So given the safety and sustainability pressures, do you think we'll see these aspects of our industries changing? And I think I'll come to David uh, first on this one, please. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think distributed production is the way forward. And I seem to remember a long time ago, there was uh, a push for this. Um, so I'm, I think there was a, a, a research council program on on making small scale production of chemicals like uh, I seem to remember methanol on methanol on demand was one I think was 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 bandied about where you, you had a little little skid mount mounted plant that you put wherever you needed your methanol and you turned it on and off more or less by pressing a button um, so and for, for, for hazardous materials particularly it makes much more sense to produce them in situ like chlorine is the classic example um, you don't have to transport things around um, and uh, and you've got smaller inventories um, so but so long as you've got fail safe and uh, uh, perfect containment it's uh, it's okay um, so, so it's good for supply security as well uh, because uh, as the uh, recent events have demonstrated uh, that um, uh, Thing events that you've known that you really don't see coming. Well, maybe some did, but most people didn't. Um, could have upset all sorts of supply chains, and if you've got control of your own supply, then that's much better um, for your supply security. Um, yes, high pressure and temperatures are inherently unsafe. Uh, with if, if they're particularly if unless they've got very very small inventories, but um, Generally, they don't. Um, so anything that can reduce the temperature and pressure of operations is great. Uh, you know, and again, looking at bio, you know biotechnology and it, what Ian was saying about biochemistry. Well, if you look at um, all animal life and plant life, it's all low. It's all reactions going on at very low pressure and temperature and producing all sorts of chemicals. Uh, and so. There's, I think there's loads can be done there in that area and, and catalysts are obviously, uh, and enzymes or whatever, by, uh, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on biotechnology, but that they're, they're, a, they're a good thing in that, uh, that um, area. Um, so, yes, I think that's what I've got to say. Uh, I will pass on to the next person. Well, I think you've made some uh, some interesting points there, and I, I like the one that uh, you know reducing the amount of hazardous material that needs to be transported here and there 
uh, is obviously a great benefit to decentral, um, decentralizing the production. But on your point around, you know, for, for processes that need high temperature and, and pressure, where does the trade-off lie, do you think, between if you distribute the manufacturer, you've obviously got a greater frequency of potentially high temperature and pressure uh, reactors versus having that sort of thing centralized? You know, do you, do you have a view on which of those might be safer? Well, yeah. Uh, as I said, you, you could do decentralized production in <clears throat> small, say, skid-mounted plants if you've got perfect containment. And, but you, if, if they're on a smaller scale, um, I think you've got more scope for doing that because you can, you know, you can have, you could design to to contain the highest possible pressure that you and temperatures that you could ever experience, um, which is something that Trevor Kletz always always promoted. Um, <clears throat> now, whether it's economic, but I think that we've got to get away from the bulk economics and ever you know that it that and if we're talking about you know bringing in um, <clears throat> environmental impacts etc into the way we evaluate what we're doing and and more bringing in safety as well then you know you shouldn't be really you shouldn't be just a slave to conventional economics um, so yes uh, and it, obviously it's better if you could come up with new processes that are more benign in that you get rid of the high temperature and pressure that is the ideal distributed processes low temperature low pressure but there's obviously a lot of work to be done to find out, well, what is the optimum? And we're good at optimizing stuff, so let's do it. Yes. Indeed, indeed. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, Ian, perhaps uh, I can ask you the same question here. Yeah, um, so I'm moving down the this, this same direction. And, um, you know, I think when we think about how the world needs to be, um, we, we probably need to make better uses of bio uh, resources uh, crops, etc., as as feedstocks and building uh, blocks, we we need to be thinking about energy. Uh, there's this um, move to um, a complete infatuation with electricity, but but perhaps a uh, a lack of awareness on how to create the electricity, um, and uh, and then we need to be thinking of of products, and uh, some of the renewable sources such as wind, wave, or or sun are, are not constant, so we need uh, storage systems. Um, and those storage systems don't have to be batteries. They, they could be uh, generating a, a fuel, or they could be um, uh, using um, gravity uh, in dams or, or whatever, depending on the local geo landscape uh, situation. So I think there is a need to, to consider areas and the pluses and minuses of those areas to perfect the integrated system. And in the UK, there is an example in Orkney where um, they, they have a lot of wind power uh, and they use the spare electricity to generate hydrogen. And when wind power isn't available, um, they, they burn the hydrogen to create electricity. And, uh, and this type of circular thinking needs to be more per pervasive. Uh, so, so as a direction of travel with the uh, benefits David has talked about, but also when you're looking at um, uh, bio-resources, bio usually huge tonnages of material at very low cost uh, and value are required. So the idea of transporting that all over the world to large centralized centers and then bringing whatever it is back um, doesn't make a lot of sense. I also think that we're moving into a completely new world era where globalization, which was in capital letters, is going to disintegrate into tiny letters. And, and not only do we have an ecological revolution to deal with, I think we have a geopolitical revolution to deal with as well. So for all those reasons, I, I think we need to uh, rethink the, the, the whole map and chemical engineers are well positioned uh, to play a, a key role in that. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, all right. I think in the uh, 
And let me have a look. We've got we've we've got some questions coming in from uh, from the audience, which is uh, excellent. So we'll just take a, a quick glance at uh, at some of these. But I think in um, in the meantime, before I uh, uh, read those ones, I might move us on to uh, to the next question, uh, just to keep things a little bit fresh. Uh, I might come to Judith and David for for this question just here. Uh, so far, a lot of the process. The progress on decarbonisation has been associated with production of renewable electricity. In the short term, there seems to be uh, electrification of transport and space heating because of this. What does this mean in terms of the processes chemical engineers should be involving themselves with? Uh, Judith, can I uh, ask for your thoughts on this one, please? Uh, I, I think my answer to this is very similar to what I said earlier. That. Um, Yes, yes, a lot of progress has been made in, in, in a major shift to renewable energy, uh, which, is, which is great. Uh, it, I, I personally have been uh, much encouraged by the speed with which renewable energy processes have been ad adopted and, and the extent to which we have decarbonized our, our energy systems. But there's still a long way to go. And there are still many, many processes, including the ones that we, we run as chemical engineers, which are highly energy intensive. Um, and we, and the, the simple answer is that, that it's not about sourcing that energy from renewable resources. It is about rethinking those processes to think how we make them less energy intensive. Um, I, I always think about this in terms of understanding what is the effect we are delivering to society and how can we think about doing that differently. Um, you know, it, it, whether it be detergents, whether it be flame retardants, what, whatever it is, the product that we are making, let's rethink the chemical process that delivers that effect rather than defending the old chemistry. And as far as the question here around, can we share our knowledge more broadly with other engineering disciplines? Yes, I think we can. I think we have got information to, and knowledge to share, uh, and we should do more of that. I've been um, critical of the profession in the past for not doing enough of that. I think people will know that from the work I did on, on uh, building safety, that I think much of what we know and have learned, we haven't shared with other people. But this is not a one-way street. There is much that we can learn from other disciplines too, and we need to recognize that, and we need to recognize that this is an interchange of knowledge rather than us simply sharing what we know with others. Thank you, Judith. Uh, David, any, uh, any comments on that, please? Um, yeah, so... Um... Yeah, chemical engineers are going to be involved in the production of the renewable um, electricity, but also in the um, in the storage. Because as I think he had said earlier, you know, there's uh, renewables are great, wind power, solar power, etc., is great, but um, sometimes the wind doesn't blow and sometimes the sun doesn't shine. And there are there have been cases where there's been no wind at all in this country over the whole country, so that all the wind turbines were not turning. Um, so we, we do need we do need energy storage, which again Ian mentioned, and a lot and a lot of that uh, in the short term is probably going to be batteries. Um, and chemical engineers are in, are are involved in the production of materials for batteries. I know that for a fact because uh, I put some money into a company called Cornish Lithium who who are who their intention is to produce lithium in Cornwall um, by geothermal by digging by and geothermal energy at the same time because the lithium is held in aquifers which are hot because uh, they are deep in the in the earth and uh, when the water come, the water comes out it's hot and can be used for uh, for um, for heating as well and uh, but the lithium needs to be got out of the out of solution etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there's the there are problems though with and there will be big challenges with batteries because uh, uh, lithium iron batteries there are as far as I can see the all the safety implications have not been worked out yet I know that they have they have big in, in, 
installations of these on like uh, um, floating production storage offloading vessels which have been developed recently and they have had battery fires and and you you don't really know how those fires develop they are self-sustaining the the stuff that's nasty chemicals that are given off the it's not really very understood um so there needs to be a lot of work there um also i don't remember once when i was uh, a long time ago so i i I'm not i the details have faded but there was a i think it was a black start facility for a power station and they were going to use a fuel cell I think uh, they had two chemicals which were stored in uh, big tanks um, which would go into the fuel cell and generate electricity somehow I'm not quite sure um, but what I what I my concern was that these two tanks were together if they'd been breached the containment loss the chemicals had mixed together and would have caused a huge release of bromine which would have floated nicely over a local Tesco's so uh, the, there's big problems, uh, challenges, challenge, challenges, not problems, um, and uh, that we need to that we need to work out. And of course, in doing that, yeah, we've got to share it with other engineering disciplines. You know, I don't know about fuel cells. That's other people do that. So um, and and in mining as well. And as I talked about with extracting lithium, you have to work together with other disciplines. Thanks, David. I'm actually going to uh, bring in a, uh, a question from the audience uh, just on that, that latter point there. So Sayadeen Mohammed uh, asked a question. He said he's been uh, rather confused lately. After 20 years of working in the oil and gas industry, I'm midway studying a master's in sustainable engineering. Recently, I did a course in revolutionizing the transport industry by electrification where we are using heaps of fossil fuels to mine minerals to manufacture a lithium-ion battery. How on earth can that be more sustainable? Uh, yes. I wonder if uh, uh, perhaps, uh, Ian, have you got a, a, a comment on that one? Um, well, well, I think um, he's making a very good point. And um, to um, David earlier, um, uh, once politicians start imposing uh, new regulations like the electrification of cars, uh, people become totally focused on on that goal, uh, not necessarily the total uh, sustainability issue. So, um, I think from where we are today, we we need a rethink in battery technology and uh, and and the use of different materials because the current uh, stocks of uh, lithium and, and other battery materials are, are extremely uh, um, threatened and, and insubstantial. So um, this deeper thinking of the whole problem and, and thinking of the total system is, is, is required. And I would encourage uh, the customer to continue with uh, line of reasoning uh, with passion and communication. Uh, as he moves forward. <laughs> yeah, could I could I come in there? Um, Please do. I do think, it, yes. Yeah, I mean the the I think in this case we talk about systems thinking a lot, and that's you know very and what is one of our great skills. But it um and and I think the ultimate expression of that is life cycle analysis. And if you yeah. you know you're looking at um, is it best to have lithium but do you use fossil, loads of fossil fuels and other resources in extracting the lithium well yeah you need to do the life cycle analysis and work out what is what is the as i said the optimum way of doing it in terms of uh, but not just economically now but in terms of environmental impact etc uh and uh yeah life cycle analysis yeah, indeed. And I think there's a, a similar point with, uh, you know, big power stations such as Drax, uh, who, are, who are burning uh, wood pellets, which is obviously, uh, you know, broadly a good thing for the environment. But those wood pellets are coming all the way from North America and Canada, yeah. which sounds, yeah. you know, again, I think your point on life cycle analysis is uh, what gives us the answer there. Uh, and there's another uh, question here from Colin uh, uh, Felto on this point. How well are we preparing our engineers to deal with these sort of challenges? Uh, Trish, I wonder if you've got any thoughts on, you know, whether something like life cycle analysis or is that uh, sort of adequately presented at uh, early stages in people's careers? 
I was just going to comment on, so I reflected um, in a meeting recently with some people where I said, 15 years ago, I actually went and studied life cycle analysis because I thought it was going to be a critically important uh, tool for engineers to be able to use to make better decisions with. And in the last 15 years, it doesn't appear to have gone anywhere. Um, it, it just seems to have faded away and we've forgotten that we need to really focus on these decisions. And it's it's a little bit similar to inherently safer design as well. We need to make sure that we have as much information as we practically can, analyse it critically as an engineer, and then make an engineering based decision on what is the better outcome. Because inherently safer design is a trade off and it always will be between what what occurs as a safer option to something else because nothing is absolutely safe and from a life cycle analysis perspective we need to make sure that we really train people to be able to critically analyze all aspects of the entire loop and it needs to be a, a closed loop process as well if we're really going to achieve great outcomes here and look at how we can make sure people can understand okay we might be doing some great work with with wood pellets that's great but yeah what fossil fuels are we putting into those wood pellets to get them to wherever the station is, if that's what's going on? Uh, you know, the continuous use of fossil fuels to, to mine, to create lithium, to create batteries, yet yeah, there's something not quite right in that equation. We need to be doing something different. So, you know, thinking about even at, a, at, at local individual household levels, what can we be doing? So, for example, in our house, we are installing solar panels. And we are installing a battery so that we can basically be self-sustainable in our own generation of electricity. And then we'll have a heat pump for our hot water service and those sorts of things as well. So we're trying to create as closed a loop as possible. But understanding as we make that decision as a household, we are using fossil fuels to get to that point initially. Um, it will get better over time, but it needs positive action to get better over time. And I do think we need to be really focusing engineering education a lot more on life cycle analysis across multi-disciplines. And I don't think we teach it well enough uh, at this stage in any discipline. And I think that is a, an absolute um, travesty of how we educate our engineers. I would agree with Thanks. that, Trish. I think um, I, it, I delivered a lecture here in Bristol last night to the Engineering Professors Council about how do we how do we educate engineers for the for the challenges of the future. And my um, my view, which I expressed to them last night, was that we're not doing a good job of it at all. We are in serious danger of educating people for the needs of the past rather than the present and the future. Uh, and, and we have to rethink the way we educate people who, who want to become engineers. And there are many reasons for that. One of which is that many of them now come to our profession, and by that I mean engineering in its broadest sense, not chemical engineering, they come to our profession because of their concern about the state of the world, because they want to make a difference, because they want to solve the problems. And if we don't give them the tools to chat, to do the things they want to do, then we're going to turn them off anyway. So we really do have to urgently address this issue of how we train and educate engineers for the future. That's a great, great. point. Indeed, I uh, couldn't agree more with that one. Thank you very much. I think um, we'll perhaps move on to uh, the next question here, question three, uh, where I might ask uh, Trish and Judith to, uh, uh, to comment on this one initially. So what do you think about the inherent safety opportunities and challenges presented by the energy and sustainability transitions that are underway at the moment? Perhaps so I'll come to, to Trish. Yeah, go ahead, Trish. Thanks, Tom. I think from my perspective, one of the things we need to be aware of is I sometimes hear people talk about, you know, we've got all these emerging hazards we need to deal with. The hazards actually haven't changed. The physics and chemistry of our environment is the same still. We still have the same laws we have to abide by in physics and chemistry. What has changed is the application and the use of the materials in our environment and how we're using them. And that has implications for what the overall risk looks like. So I think from my perspective, the big challenge is making sure that we have adequate risk assessment and management techniques available to understand the implications of the new technologies that we're looking at. Because we understand hydrogen, we understand it very well. You know, it's the, the smallest molecule that makes containment a challenge, but it's also the lightest molecule. So, you know, it, 
it is going to rise up, but it, it is potentially going to disperse quite well in some instances. We can understand and model that, but dealing with the actual containment aspect of it can be very, very challenging from a fugitive emission perspective. And you know, we don't want to lose containment of it because it's challenging to obtain it as a pure molecule. So I think we need to, to really make sure that we understand some of those risk assessment applications. And I think we need to be challenging and changing the way we think about how we assess risk in this space, because I don't think our current techniques are adequate in actually understanding. Mm -hmm. I don't think HAZOP is not necessarily a great technique to really understand hydrogen use or lithium battery fires and the like. I don't think it's very helpful in that space. I think we need new techniques in here, which is going to be the challenge. The other thing we need to be very aware of is how we respond to it too um, in an emergency situation. So, you know, the flammability of, of lithium batteries is quite concerning. You know, when if you have a battery bank that catches fire, the best thing you can do is just stand back and let it burn. And we saw that happen in Australia a few months ago where um, one of our lithium battery um, facilities that was uh, you know, a battery energy storage facility caught fire and literally everybody learnt the hard way. They just had to stand back and let this thing burn because it could not be contained. Um, and you know, some of the understanding of how charged the lithium battery is will impact how whether you can actually control a fire. So where are we placing these batteries? You then hear of stories in, you know, they're being put into buildings and they're being put in mid mid section of a high rise building to store the electricity for that building. Now, if that battery catches fire, you've got a significant issue coming back to Judith's work in building safety. So again, it's about bringing all the disciplines together that understand all the aspects of this and focusing on a holistic systemic view that systems thinking of how it all interacts together to understand that risk. That's uh, a great point. Thanks, uh, thanks, Trish. And before we bring uh, Judith in on, on that point, particularly around the batteries in, in buildings, I wonder if uh, I can just pose you the, the, the latter part of the question. If there are any process safety approaches and techniques out there that you, uh, you hope will achieve widespread industrial application, is there anything that you're sort of aware of that you'd like to see brought in? I think we're still in development stage, to be honest. I don't think we yet have developed the techniques to go wide scale. I'm seeing uh, a lot of different um, different work at the moment, particularly in this space, things like focusing on transient operations. Because as, again, as, as engineers, we've often been focused more on steady state operations, but a lot of this activity in this space is transient operation activity. And we really need to develop and share better how to manage and assess the risk of transient operations so we can better control it. So that's, that's I think, an important area to go forward with. But um, I still think we're in early days, unfortunately. There's a bit of work to do. Thanks, Trish. Uh, Judith, let's, uh, let's come to you with the, the same question then here. Um, I, I think the opportunities are very significant to, to uh, and, and, I, and I don't think it's a choice. Uh, we, we started off talking about uh, the world we live in today is very different. Uh, trust is probably at an all time low, whether that be in politicians or industry or anyone else. People, it, so we talk a lot about people being risk averse. I think it's more than that. I think there's actually a, 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 an absence of trust. So anything new, anything different, people are suspicious of in the first instance. And um, so we don't have a choice but to move uh, cautiously, speedily, yes, but, we've, but we have to identify the risks and the hazards as we go and we have to deal with them. And I think the most important thing for me is we have to be prepared to think the unthinkable. Every one of us, I'm sure, can think of times in our lives in industry where someone has said, what happens if, and someone else has said, that will never happen and the debate gets closed off. We have to stop that. We have to go through that what happens if and how did we do, how would we deal with it and be prepared to think about the most unlikely events because I think we've learned the lesson the hard way, particularly in the last few years, that even the most unlikely events do happen and we need to know how to deal with them. That's how we build resilience. If I could just comment on that as well, Judith, I think um, absolutely that really brings in the concept of, of NATEC risk assessment and management. So natural hazard triggering technological disasters. 
And we are seeing more of these because of climate change. So yeah. it's a, a vicious perpetu self-perpetuating circle that we're seeing with this. And in a NATEC assessment, we have to consider the worst possible consequence without looking at the probability. So it's actually half the risk assessment um, yeah. equation, in fact, in NATEC. We only look at the consequence and we look at the worst consequence and then figure out how we can possibly mitigate it as much as possible. Because yeah. for some of these events, we can't prevent them. We can't prevent the earthquake that's going to cause the tsunami. But how can we mitigate the outcome of that incident occurring? Yes, exactly. Exactly, Chris, Trish. Yeah, indeed. Um, and so, it, Judith, in your point about we need we need to consider, you know, what what really could be the sort of worst case scenarios in here. I mean, do do you think that something like HAZOP is an adequate tool to to force those conversations uh, with people to make sure that you are you know you are addressing the the unthinkable as you called it? Um, I think it's a good place to start, but I'm with Trish. It's not enough, not enough by any means. And I think we we must recognise the need to develop new and more advanced tools as well as using the ones we've already got. I, I'm with Trish. I think that the extent to which we have failed to adopt life cycle analysis as a as an embedded process in everything that we do is a real disappointment. So I think we've got to get much better at using the tools and techniques we already have. But we also have to recognise that they they themselves, the tools, need to be developed uh, and, and built on as the world around us becomes more and more complex and challenging. And I might ask you again, uh, as I did with uh, with Trish, just uh, you know, whilst we've uh, we've got process safety experts on on the panel, are there any uh, you know new approaches that you you are aware of that you'd like to see uh, achieving more widespread application? Well, uh, could I come in there and say? So, so, uh, well, I mean, I think uh, we do have tools which are maybe underutilized, like life cycle analysis. I mean, has it when you, which is what what we always used to do is the first pass um, um, tool for looking at what could happen is a is a is a good tool it could do with development for where you do think well what is the worst that could happen and you do actually say well no, no you can't say this can't happen if it is credible and, and it could happen then you need to evaluate it um, and and that as a as a tool I think could be more used and um, and better developed in the, in the early this is, this is in the early stages of process we are going to be developing new processes so we need to be looking in the early stages and that's when you can do your inherent safety and say well look can we avoid this this hazard completely certainly um thanks david so there's a a question on on the subject as well from eliza uh, doyer uh, from your experience, are the tools for LCA studies suitably standardized for LCA to be a robust and reliable system? There are multiple permutations of the study. Does this allow manipulation of a study to affect the transparency of the study? Uh, maybe this is one to, for, for Trish initially, but uh, uh, feel free to, to, to jump in, anybody, if you've got comments. Yeah, I think sadly, Tom, um, we are seeing that that because LCA has been around for a while but not really well embraced, it has been hijacked in a number of ways. And there are multiple methods for doing an LCA and they do give you different outcomes. And some of them can be wildly different outcomes. And so we do need to be very careful we don't have a situation where people just game the system to find the outcome they are after with it. So I think there's a place for bodies like iChemE and other um, learned institutions to actually work on standardising a methodology for LCA, taking the best of what's out there and standardising a methodology so that we can have one that we we all agree is the one that's going to give us at least a consistent answer. If, as long as it's consistent, we can then start to compare. It's a bit like a quantitative risk assessment. On its own, it doesn't tell you much. Comparatively, it can tell you an enormous amount. So you know, if we can get everybody to work to the same sort of standard, I think that's absolutely critical so that we can actually move forward and have a comparative tool that we can then use effectively. So there's still some work to be done in that space. Yeah, I think I think the problem is with, with life cycle analysis as well is it's not just the, the way you do it, it's, it's what you do it with, the data that you use. 
and you need you need so much data that um, you cannot possibly generate it all yourself so you need to be drawing it from various places and we need some sort of standardized um, data bank that, that you know, this this is what you use for this this impact or this input or or whatever um, because otherwise you yeah you could gain it very very easily by choosing the data that you use And I might uh, challenge us then here. So uh, Saibun Mohammed, who uh, asked the previous question about uh, life cycle analysis, is also uh, saying what, what's concerning with his uh, master's degree at a, at a top university, nothing's being taught about life cycle analysis. What is the ICME doing to improve this? Or perhaps should the ICME be doing more to, uh, to influence what is being uh, taught you know, about life cycle uh, assessments uh, in accredited universities, perhaps? Uh, Ian, do you have any, any thoughts on that, perhaps? Um, definitely. I mean, the accreditation process mm -hmm. gives the ICME uh, quite a lot of leverage or even power to uh, to influence uh, curricula. Um, so it should definitely be taking a lead role. One of the issues around uh, there are uh, many issues around life cycle analysis. One is the data, but also the, there are a variety of methodologies. And, um, and and I don't think there's going to be the perfect tool. So not only <clears throat> teaching uh, how to use a tool, but, but guiding on, on how to be aware of the strengths and weaknesses of those tools, which could be situation specific uh, as well, uh, I think is very important. We've, in the ICME, recently set up the Sustainability Hub, which has a number of teaching modules, things like um, LCA and also uh, ethics are, are, are in that. And, and I think more could be d done to infiltrate some of the um, ICME uh, resources into university curricula. And um, I'm just not clear within the uh, institution where that lead should come from. Thanks Ian. Um, any, any other comments from, uh, uh, from the rest of the panel? Or I've got a, um, another question uh, related from Michael Haley who says, does the panel think uh, the time is right for a change of policy or best practice to push companies to complete LCA or a demonstration of carbon reduction to as low as reasonably practical as we have with safety in the industry. In some areas, we're now seeing the requirement to consider the scope three emissions from projects that are um, being undertaken. So there's a, a project on the Northwest shelf uh, in Australia where the company has had to consider scope three emissions as part of their environmental approval processes. So I think that's a, an important part to really understand the overall impact that a project can have in that space. So it's not just about the amount of carbon intensity going to extracting the gas, um, but we also have to consider the impact of the use of the gas in, in future, because we can't just pull it out of the ground somewhere and say, well, that's someone else's problem. That's going to help it. That's going to affect someone else's environment because it's our environment. It's everybody's environment. So I think we're starting to see some of that occur from looking at the scope one, two and three emission activities um, for different projects. But that's probably about as far as I've seen it go anywhere. Yeah, I, th I think I think that's off the top of my head. That sounds like a very good idea to me. Uh, you know, and uh, maybe we could get that into legislation. You know, the, the um, Health and Safety Work Act was groundbreaking legislation. It stood the test of time and uh, that introduced, uh, you know, the risk based approach and the LARP, etc. So, yeah, why not for um, environment, for, um, for um, carbon um, impact? Yeah, good idea, I think. Thanks, David. Off the top and, of my uh, head. Uh, maybe just uh, one more on, on life cycle analysis before we, we move on. Uh, is, uh, so, uh, Bowen Huang uh, asked, is the problem that it's only a life cycle analysis and not a life cycle execution across the supply chains and, uh, and end of life? So, uh, you know, w once you've done your analysis, what should we then be doing about it? 
that's like a risk assessment, isn't it? So um, lots of people seem to think that doing a risk assessment is job done. The whole point of doing a risk assessment is that you then do something about what it tells you. And if you don't, then, then you've wasted your time doing a risk assessment. But the whole point is it informs the action that you then take. The same has to be true of life cycle analysis. No point doing it unless you're then going to look at the results and say, how can I improve this? How can I make it more sustainable? Uh, it, if people use tools as this is the solution, that's wrong. You're using the tool to help you get to the answer. And people have got to focus on what are we trying to do here? And let's not beat about the bush. We're trying to save the planet, for goodness sake. And we need to use all of these tools to get us there and get us there in a way that isn't driven by one crisis after another in terms of weather or disasters or whatever it is, but that we actually engineer our way to a better world. Proactive rather than reactive, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah, and not uh, treating it as a as a tick box exercise. So we, we've, we've got some more questions on LCA, but I think in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, move us on if that's all right. Uh, so apologies if I haven't got your question, but there will be space, um, time at the end for, for audience questions so we can perhaps come back to this point. I'm gonna move us on to question four uh, for, for Ian and, and Trish to, uh, to, to have a look at, I think. Um, we're also seeing a lot of interest in digitalization and increased automation in industry at the moment. <clears throat> So how do you see this affecting the safety of industry in the future? Will it make us safer or does the move away from simplicity in our systems pose a safety challenge? Can I come to Ian first on, on this one, please? Thank you. Well, I think we have to recognise that there's been um, explosive development and innovation in IT, both in terms of processing power increasing, but also uh, effective storage power and storage and data and information storage techniques. I think there's quite a lot of uh, misunderstanding around words like uh, digitalization, artificial intelligence, and uh, there's also a big difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning, machine learning algorithms. And I think chemical engineers in, in, in the world of process systems engineering can move uh, a long way forward in, in gathering high quality data and using machine learning algorithms to give much higher levels of predictability, anal analysis and predictability. And playing back to Judith's point, then using that uh, for better design with both inherent and intrinsic safety, um, depending on, on our colleagues in um, in, in um, process control and uh, electronic engineering. And, um, and, 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 and hence, we can perhaps create a much um, more secure platform uh, going forward into design. Once we get into operation, um, we can start thinking then about artificial intelligence and, and, and how we might control things more effectively. I know I'm going against your point of are we moving from a simple to a more complicated world, but I think the world is often much more complicated than we think with our simple analyses. And, and so I actually think um, we must take advantage of the power that we are, are gaining. On the other hand, when it comes to running operations, and I think we've seen this before with so-called computer controlled plants, that there's a danger that human beings start to think the system is inherently safe and uh, that the system takes care of itself. And they fail to recognize the normal signals that should be tri tri triggering huge alarm bells. So there's a balance to be had here in terms of better knowledge, better understanding, better modeling, better predictability, and better control systems, but always recognizing that there's a, there, there is a, a, a risk of, of, of things going wrong and never being complacent and having the necessary 
safety mechanisms, human cleaning mechanisms and conditioning mechanisms in place. It's all down to behavior, which uh, is difficult to program. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Ian. So, uh, uh, yes, your, your point on computer controlled, you know, if you're, if you're programming in a response to a problem, you, you have to anticipate all of the problems. And if you uh, fail to anticipate it at the start, then the system won't know what to what to do with it if it, if it should occur. Right. Uh, thanks. Uh, Trish, do you have any uh, comments on this one, please? Yeah, so I think um, I think we also need to be very careful about drawing a distinction between uh, simplicity and simplistic. So the world is not simplistic and simplistic systems and processes will not help us do anything. But we do need to focus on being able to simplify what's going on and the human element is absolutely critical in doing that. So, you know, if we look at aviation as an example, we still have pilots that have to learn the fundamental physics of flight and they have to learn the fundamental um, methods of navigation. And that is because even though they fly these incredibly complex aircraft, they still have to be able to respond when their systems fail them. And you know, you'll hear pilots talk about in the event of an incident, the first thing they do is aviate, they've got to keep the plane in the air, they've got to navigate, they've got to figure out where they are, and then they've got to communicate what's going on to safely come out of the situation. And we need to be very careful when we get so complex in our digitalization of our systems that we can run the risk of not training people in the fundamental physics of flight equivalent. So the idea of walking through a plant and hearing that the plant sounds different today or the air feels different in the plant today. We've got to be very careful we don't lose training of people in that ability because when the system goes down for some reason, which can occur, they can be left literally flying blind and that can be a significant issue for them. I think we need to be very careful that we don't forget the simple part of this equation, which is there are fundamental principles of operation that people need to understand. So I'm coming to this more from an operation rather than a design perspective. We need to make sure people know how to operate their plant safely in the event of their systems failing, because we've got to be aware of common mode failure occurring with our digitalization systems. We have all sorts of other issues around if we don't get the programming of it correct, if we don't anticipate that particular scenario, if we don't anticipate the response to that particular scenario, we can end up with a whole series of uh, activities that we didn't expect to happen and we're left just trying to fight and respond to. When that all goes wrong, the example we saw was a 737 MAX from the aviation sector as well. So, you know, these things can occur, we need to manage them a lot better. And Simplification is one of the fundamental, inherently safer design principles. You know, we talk about eliminate, substitute, minimise, moderate, and simplify. You know, that is how we get it as easy as possible for the human to get it right, rather than making it easy for the human to trip up and make a mistake by putting all sorts of barriers in the way. And at the end of the day, we still have to come down to we still have humans operating these plants and I think we will for a very long time because I don't think AI certainly in my lifetime will have that capability to have completely taken over all aspects without any human interaction. So I think we need to, to make sure we still keep a, a view to simplification, not making things simplistic though. Thanks Trish, that's a uh, yeah, great point there. Uh, I wonder if uh, Judith or David, did you have any uh, any any thoughts on on what's been said so far? I, I think ref reflecting on on what others have said, it it feels to me like this is this is yet another part of um, the progression of things. Uh, Digitalisation and the ability to manage huge amounts of data and to have better information at our hands to 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 manage processes is a huge advantage over where we've been in the past. Uh, but, it, but it comes with all of the things that, that both Trish and Ian have talked about, that if we allow that to, to um, lead to us saying, oh, well, we can all sit back now and this whole thing is going to run itself, clearly that is, that is a risk. We have to recognise that the tools and the technologies uh, are there to help us and used in the right way, they will help us to deliver better safety, better sustainability and so on. But but that human element of using that in a positive and constructive way, uh, rather than seeing it as a threat, is hugely important. 
Yeah, um, yeah, I, I agree with all that Trish says, and uh, I mean, I'm a you know an inherent safety person. Um, I do strongly believe keep things simple. I don't, but I have a real problem with AI. I, I don't believe the this artificial intelligence is is it's not intelligence. It's just better. It's just more complicated and maybe better algorithms. That's all it is. It's it's not intelligence. Um, and yeah, I still strongly believe that you try the best the best. Sis, the best ways of making things are the simple, elegant ones. Ones where if it goes wrong, it fails safely. Uh, that uh, that you minimise human intera interaction because you don't need them because the th the thing looks after itself. And by you know by bugging on lots of control, more and more control systems is is not making it look after itself. It might do while everything's going well, but when everything's going not so well it, it, there's much more danger that it won't look after itself and that it won't fail safely um so yeah I, I, this is a big challenge um you know my father used to say well we're complicating ourselves out of existence you know but there's loads of it, examples in life of things that we don't really need you know like loyalty cards and all this kind of stuff um I know it creates employment, but why do we need them? What, what's in all this data? You know, it's just it's not for our benefit. It's for the company's benefits. And uh, in the same way, uh, yeah, keep things simple. Keep it simple. If you possibly can, keep it simple and fail safe. I think, Tom, if I can add just, just one example of where I think we could use uh, better data and digitalization to great advantage. We talk a lot in the process safety world about leading indicators, things that tell us before the event occurs that things are not as they should be. <laughs> if we were simply to embrace the idea that more data means we've got more information at our hands to tell us how a process is running and to sound those leading indicator alarm bells, that would be a major, major step forward. Thanks, uh, Judith. Thanks all for the for the, the answers there. Um, I want want to come back to I think what uh, uh, Trish was saying about the the feeling of if we don't want to lose uh, the you know the, what people can say from their experience of saying oh the plant sounds different or maybe it smells different or or whatever it may be on a on a day. Now, if we are you know training people to 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 use these new kind of tools obviously the workforce is going to move on and some of the people with the most experience of the the hands-on elements perhaps risk uh leaving the uh, the workforce do you, do you think that is a a risk that we um well we risk losing that kind of uh, that level of knowledge that you know comes with experience rather than uh, study i think we do i think there is a challenge at the moment as we're seeing worldwide in a number of industries what's been called the great resignation effect you know we are having people now that are saying well the last two and a half years have been incredibly disruptive and i don't like where it's going so i'm opting out of working in this way in the future and so we're starting to see not only are we seeing baby boomers start to um, retire we're starting to see the early stages of gen x now starting to retire as well and with all of that, we're losing an enormous amount of experience. The people that, that did sort of grow up in the plant feeling the plant operations rather than seeing it on a screen. I think we need to come up with some creative ways to try and train some of those fundamentals though. And I think from a digital perspective, there are opportunities in that space. I think there's enormous value in augmented reality. I'm less convinced there's as much value in virtual reality though, from a, a simulation perspective. But I think augmented reality has enormous opportunity for us. I think we need to be careful that we can pick the right technologies to use to help us, to help transition that knowledge from the experienced generation to the newer generations coming in. But make sure that we don't just pick a new technology because it's exciting and sexy and everybody wants to be involved in it like virtual reality without actually knowing whether it produces a better learning outcome, for example, if we're using it for training. Um, so I think we need to, to be a, bit, a little bit careful about how we do these things. Apply sound engineering judgment and management of change when we adopt a new process. And in all of that, management of organisational change, recognising that there are things that aren't written down, there are things that people know and experience, and we need to figure out ways 
to have them transfer that experience to others, whether it's through workshops, whether it's through mentoring activities. As someone you know transitions into retirement, make sure that they take the young engineers out for a walk through the plant every week and look at a different piece of equipment and have a discussion about how this one sounds, why it does this, what it's doing, what the purpose is, what's, what unusual things you've seen in your career happen with that piece of plant. I think there's all sorts of things we need to be a little bit better at embracing there and recognising the human element here is absolutely critical to the success. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, thanks Trish. Great, so I think we've got about uh, 15 or so minutes left. So I'm going to turn to some questions from uh, from the audience. We've had some uh, uh, some brilliant ones so far. Please do add any more in, in our, our final minutes. Uh, there's a couple uh, relating to nuclear power. So I might do a couple on, on this one here. So there's a question from Ian Thomas, who says, uh, we are intent on the very dangerous nuclear fission process uh, evidently because we all seem to want plutonium to make bombs to throw at each other. It's not provocative at all, I'm sure. Uh, why not let us seriously consider and develop further the thorium molten salt reactor, which is inherently so much safer, produces far less radioactive waste, can consume existing stockpiled waste, and uh, heaven forbid, does not produce plutonium. Any thoughts on that one? Maybe David? Um, yeah, well, it, I mean, I don't know anything about the thorium cycle or that so i can't comment on that uh, but in generally nuclear power i mean i remember was it lovelace one of the guy the, the guy who came up with the gaia hypothesis was it he said which was in the really early days of when people were thinking about climate change says so well nuclear is great because it produces no co2 and uh and i agree with that um but you know then the, the and it provides your base load. It just sits there and produces electricity come rain or shine, hail or high water. Well, not high water, that's a problem. When, um, uh, but uh, I, yeah, I, that I think I've, I mean, I know from previous conversations, I think with people who know more, that there are nuclear cycles now that, <clears throat> that do produce much less waste uh, and. Uh, they, uh, they, they, we should. I think we should be looking at that. Yeah, no, I know Rolls Royce are coming up, are uh, developing a small modular nuclear reactor um, that could be used more locally instead of having to have huge installations. Uh, and that's always been the case on nuclear submarines and icebreakers, hasn't it? And they seem to work okay. Um, so uh, I think nu nuclear has really should have a place. And again, it's but it's against the, it's this risk thing, isn't it? The public perception. I mean, nuclear has hardly killed anyone, um, and uh, hydro has been as uh, hydroelectricity is the the power source that has killed by far the most people because of big dam bursts in in China, for example. But nuclear has hardly killed anyone. So, but the public perception of it is that they don't understand it, uh, and it's and it's unseen, and it's a, a risk that you can't can't visualize it or touch it or that, and we don't want it. And, and I thought. I thought that the German decision to abandon their nuclear program was, I thought at the time it was crazy and now they're, now the chickens are coming home to roost, aren't they? But yeah, I would, I would, I'm very much in favour of nuclear as long as the, you've got the, you could, yeah, have better waste management and the security aspects are controlled, etc. Great, thanks David. A couple of uh, very interesting points there on uh, yeah, the public understanding and appreciation for the risk and also uh, uh, being in favour of decentralisation, as you mentioned uh, uh, earlier on. Are there any other uh, comments from from the panel? Ian, have you got any thoughts on on nuclear and whether it's uh, you know where that sits in the the drive towards low carbon energy? Well, I definitely think it's part of the armory um, to some of my earlier comments, and, and I am a, a believer in the concept of more modular reactors and a decentralised uh, systems approach where. Um, there could be a combination of renewable energy, uh, nuclear, uh, maybe some kind of uh, combustion fuel, uh, a hydrogen or hydrogen carrying um, fuel generated by nuclear uh, when, when necessary, or even um, some of the biotechnology, uh, to, <clears throat> for example, to uh, try and uh, move from using uh, 
biofuels to make uh, methanol or ethanol and try to get to jet fuel um, or, or large molecules. One of the big problems is uh, the energy balance because you're often using anaerobic fermentation systems and, uh, and, and you need energy and, and often hydrogen uh, would be, would, would be a, 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 a good source of energy. So moving to decentralized, smaller scale, localized, uh, integrated systems to, to handle energy, raw materials, products, I think it's part of the mix. <clears throat> Thanks, Ian. Yeah. Um, so again, on the sort of the perception of uh, of risk, I mean, you know, all, all energy sources do come with uh, with some level of risk, uh, of course. And uh, on the idea of it being uh, sort of understood, um, there's uh, you know parallels to the the idea of being in control. And the better that you understand something, the more sort of comfortable we are with the uh, with the risk. Um, so I suppose with on the nuclear point, how do we sort of control for the risks that are obviously inherent in there you know we don't need to mention things like uh, you know chernobyl is what uh, what most people will think of when you when you mention nuclear power to them and it you know that that and the combination of i think uh, a lot of media reaction does lead to uh, and it discourages uh, you know sensible discussion and it, things get uh, get quite animated perhaps and, and emotional about about it but how how do you think we can we can best sort of manage the the associated risks if uh, if nuclear is to be part of our our future. Julius, uh, any the, thoughts the first, on that? The first thing I think I take issue with, Tom, is 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 your, you know, a side of we don't need to mention Chernobyl. Yes, we do. We need to mention Chernobyl because people know about it, but they don't understand what happened there. So because they don't understand what happened and why, they continue to be fearful of all nuclear. If we want to build trust to enable us to move more quickly and introduce new technologies, we've got to be able to explain to the public at large, this is what happened at Chernobyl, this is why it went wrong, this is what happened at Three Mile Island, this is what happened uh, in Japan uh, in the tsunami. We need to be able to take people through, these are the mistakes that we make, and hands up, the engineers made those mistakes, but we've learned from that. And when we introduce these new technologies, this is how we're going to manage the risk going forward. Because we recognize we didn't get it right in the past. And unless we're prepared to do that, they will continue to hold those suspicions based on the past and not recognize that we have learned and moved on and take our responsibilities much more seriously. So, yeah, a great point. Yes, Judith. Um, absolutely. We should talk about these uh, these things, but, uh, you know, I think my my point was that we should we should try and have a an, a, an informed conversation about it rather than uh, um, you know a, a, an emotional sort of uh, reaction. But no, absolutely. I, I take your point. And 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 what's more, we need to explain what happened in non-technical language. It is no point talking about it in terms that we as engineers will understand, which is unintelligible to most of the people who are our opponents, resistors, or whatever you want to call them. We need to be able to explain it in ways that they will understand. And that doesn't mean talking down to them. It means, you know, being mindful of the need to communicate in non-technical language. But we also need to acknowledge that we, we can't discount the emotion that they feel around it. So to be able to have an informed discussion, we actually need to acknowledge and listen and you know, to a certain extent, validate the emotion that is out there in the community. Because if we don't, there will just continue to be resistance based on emotion. We can't just say, well, we need to have a rational conversation, so put your emotions aside, because that's not how human beings work. We need to acknowledge their emotional response to it and then work forward by taking them through the steps and at each stage, acknowledging the emotional response that we're getting. We can't just ignore that. That's not how you do effective communication. Mm. Yeah. Great point. Thanks, thanks, Trish. And uh, I might bring in a point that Martin Pitt uh, made in the audience uh, a little bit earlier on, but uh, uh, coincides nicely, I think, with this point here. So you mentioned that the the fear of risk, which is outside of your control, uh, is not a is it not a greater problem the fearless nature of some politicians and business people in taking risks with other people's money and life? They will save costs by accepting risks they deem acceptable, but which 
uh, may come to, to happen often enough. That's that's a really deep question um, and, and and quite a difficult one, I think, for us to answer in the remaining five minutes in this in this webinar. But 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 I think my initial observation would be we have to recognize that that's what being a politician sometimes is all about, looking at the bigger picture and balancing risks once one against the other. Um, that's not to say I think they're all doing a good job of this at the moment, because I don't think they are. Um, and I think one of the issues that that raises is whether or not our, our politicians and our policy makers, more importantly, uh, and I would focus on the policy makers, have um, the tools at their disposal to assess risk in the way that we understand and that we know. And, and I think there is much more that we can do to help those policy makers and politicians to understand our methodologies, our thinking, because a lot of the way we think as engineers is equally applicable to the way in which they make policy. Whether it's systems thinking, um, wh whatever it may be, we should not confine those, those things to simply engineering challenges. They are just as important in terms of ways of, of assessing policy on humanitarian issues uh, and, and environmental issues. And we could do a lot as engineers by sharing our, our knowledge and our skills in those areas with people who are in positions of, uh, of making much broader policy decisions that affect us all. Uh, David, I'm struggling to hear you just uh, at the moment. I don't know if you've perhaps muted yourself. Sorry, I was muted. Um, Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I agree, I agree with that very much. Yeah, but how? my problem is how do how do we get to politicians, uh, or how do we get them to be intro to to take to consult us and to take notice of what we say? I mean, I've always I mean maybe Ian knows more about that. I'm sure. Uh, well, Ian and Judith, I'm sure. Uh, well, everyone actually, apart from myself, because I don't I don't know how you do that. How you do the well, influence? Is it? Let me give you an example, David. For the last for the last five years now, the Royal Academy of Engineering has been running a policy fellowship program, uh, where we bring in uh, at least two cohorts a year of uh, anywhere between ten and fifteen civil servants. Uh, and the whole purpose of those policy fellowships is to teach civil servants systems thinking and helping them to see how applying systems thinking to the particular problem they've been assigned to deal with in whatever department they're in helps them to think through what are the workable solutions to the challenges that they're facing. It's a great program and we're building a, a, a substantial uh, alumni group around that. Um, I know that, you know, a hundred or so civil servants is, is a drop in the ocean compared to the number we've got, but we have to start somewhere. And if we can grow a program like that, I think we can do a lot. Thanks very much, Judith. I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, uh, close, end the, the discussion there. I appreciate this could go on for, for, for quite a little while, but uh, apologies, we, we are out of, out of time there. So um, I think um, I'd better just say a, a very uh, grateful thanks then to, uh, to all of our panelists for, for today, for this, uh, this really interesting discussion. Uh, so many thanks to, uh, to Judith Hackett, to David Edwards, Trish Karen, and Ian Schott for joining us today. I think we've, uh, we've covered quite a lot of, uh, of ground today. Uh, apologies, we, we, we did have more questions uh, in, in the chat box, uh, which we haven't managed to come to. Um, but uh, again, I think we could have uh, gone on for for several more hours on this one. So uh, I'd like to also uh, express thanks to um, the process and safety editorial panel uh, chaired by David Edwards, who helped to put this uh, this event together and all the other people associated with uh, with organizing the, the ChemEng evolution. Uh, we've got uh, several more exciting um, events coming up during the rest of this uh, centenary year. So uh, with that, I'll just say a final thanks very much to, to the panel. Thank you very much to uh, everyone in the audience for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much for chairing it, Tom. It's uh, yeah. excellent. Well yeah, and thanks, thanks, uh, Hope.
hope everyone enjoyed it and uh yes yeah, let's uh send some feedback if you've got any uh, more comments and yeah yeah, I mean, indeed. I think you get a, a feedback form at the end of this one. Um, so, uh, yes, please do uh, let us know your comments so we see how we can improve in future. Thanks very much, everybody. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.